to be here today. Welcome to my kitchen because we are in the kitchen today. I will be doing a little bit of demo and a little bit of lecturing and just, a, hey, I don't have to actually talk to myself this time. So this is great. Um, during the lecture, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me. It's totally okay. I have my notes to kind of keep me, <laughs> to keep me on, on task. And so I don't, so eventually we'll come back to the notes, but we can delineate, that's fine. Um, we're here to have fun and to geek out about food today because this is what this is about and it's super exciting. Uh, so um, as, as Aaron said today, we are making a 16th century apple tart. This, uh, this recipe is from a cookbook from the Netherlands. So if you don't know where the Netherlands are, um, so uh, you know where like Germany and Swiss in uh, yeah Switzerland, not Sweden, Switzerland is. Well, they're they're right on that uh, northwest coast there. Uh, kind of like I think where Holland is. So Holland is part of the Netherlands. Um, so at this point in time in the 16th century, they're more a region than an actual country. Um, so so this is what we're looking at. This is the regional food. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna, I just want to, oh, uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am Baroness Lottie Winterborn, um, I'm mainly known as Abby Stranathan. Um, I am a, uh, I am educated as a pastry chef. I'm not currently working as a pastry chef, but, um, but I do as much freelancing as I can on the side. Uh, so, so this is one of my geek, and I, I love talking to people about food. I love eating food. I hope you love eating food and talking about food. So we're gonna have some fun today. Um, so I'm gonna dive right into my lecture. So we're gonna get my screen up here. So I wanna share this. Oop. You're going to click. I know you're going to click. Lottie, this is Odette. I have a question. Yes, when you're talking Odette. about uh, you're talking about this cookbook. Is it the Vorselman cookbook? Um, I cannot pronounce it without reading it, but it is, I will, I will show you the title in a moment when it comes up on a PowerPoint. And I want a PowerPoint. I mean, I, I have, I've done some work from Einen Nguyen cookbook. I will, I will tell Gerhard you. Gerhard Vorselman. Okay, um, so when I come up with the slide that has the cookbook name on it, um, uh, you we can you can let me know if that's the right one or not. Um, I'm still German. I'm good. I'm okay with Dutch. is very close to German, so I'm eh, a little worse at that. Yeah, I uh, think that Dutch is really close to Middle English. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so my Dutch is better than my German. Probably the oh, lack wow. of declensions, right? <laughs> okay. All right, and we can see your slides, so you are good to go. Okay. I'm gonna see. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, I am going to see. I'm gonna hide my video so I stop watching myself as I talk to you. There we go. <laughs> All right, so. Again, this is a 16th century apple tart from the, the Netherlands, and I am Baroness Lottie Wintermore, so welcome, welcome to the class. Um, so the goal of this class is to take a look at this recipe. I've really been fascinated um, by just uh, mostly the methodology in this re recipe. Um, uh, that's one thing that I really am enjoying about historical um, recipe research is the methodology. So, um, so, uh, so we're gonna take a look at this recipe. So um, first thing I want you to do before I go back to that other side is I really want, I want you to think about what you envision an apple tart to be. So just, just, just think about that and kind of have that in your head. And then I'll, I'll go back to that, the slide that I forgot. I was gonna go there. So, um, these are modern, th this is, this may be close to what you were thinking of. So this is kind of what we think about or what you first think about when somebody says apple tart. This is the image that personally pops into my head or is, is, is one of these. You've got a nice flaky crust and usually you've got pieces of apple 
that have been that have been seasoned uh, in some way and and then baked. Um, all right. So um, this class is going to focus on the recipe, um, the ingredients within the recipe, and the method of making this recipe. Um, I, um, oh, so I'm actually somewhat demoing this as we go along. Um, I have started today, um, I'm gonna go through the steps with you, but I have started because it needs to spend an hour in the oven. So when my timer goes off, I'm just gonna stop the lecture and then show you the next step in, in the baking process. And then uh, once it goes back in the oven again, I'll continue the lecture. So that's, that's what's gonna happen. Okay, so, so we're gonna start looking at the recipe. So the recipe, Odette, this is the name of the book, is Het Est Gerdunkt Netherlands K Cookbooken. I totally, totally murdered that, but that's okay. So I am not going to read this in Dutch, but this is what the original text of the recipe looks like. And I'm gonna go ahead and go to the translation. This translation was done by Christi Christina Von Titz. Um, and uh, so I'm just gonna read this to you. So it says, apple tarts. Take apples, which are best for cooking until they fall apart. You shall peel these and cut them small. But watch out that no seeds or piece of core, core fall in because the seeds would take the whole tart. When the apples are cut up, thus into small pieces, you shall fill the crust of the same tart up, up all full. Then you shall make a lid from the same dough that the tart is made from. So we are starting out with uh, a pie-like shape. So you've got your crust, you've got just apple pieces that are in the crust, and then you have a lid. All right, then put them in the oven and let them bake thus. When they are baked, so you shall take them out and cut a, and cut a hole in the lid so that the lid stays only as a ring around the edge. Now this is the first part that really fascinates me about this recipe. So you put it in the oven and you bake it and then you take it out and then you cut the crust, the, the top of the crust off. You just, you cut it off. And, and, and I wanna know what they do with it. So, cause, they, cause going on it will reveal that we don't put that top back on. We just leave it off. Um, so then you shall stir with a wooden spoon until all the apples which lie in the tart are well broken up, or if one wants, one may pass through a sieve. Then one shall take these following spices and mix them therewith to wit, grains of paradise, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, mace, and pot sugar. But those who want to make the same tart very delicious take as well soft sugar cakes, and also sugar, which one uses for making cakes. So this is indicating that we have three different types of sugar. Pot sugar, soft sugar cakes, and sugar, which one uses for making cakes. So, and we'll come back to that when we talk about ingredients, but I just really wanted to point that out. Because it's, I think about the third read through, I'm like, wait a minute, there are three different types of sugar in this tart. <laughs> And one shall stir this together with cream, and then one shall put it in the tart with the apples and let it stand dry in the oven until it is dry. So that is the translation of the original recipe. So like I said, I am just fascinated by this. This is fantastic. Um, so, and as we go by the lecture, um, these are kind of my theories of why a lot of these things are as they are. Um, so this is my work in process recipe. You, you can see that it goes very much to what she is saying, um, you know. Oh, um, I did this, um, and I'll show you pictures. I did this two different ways. When I started, I made it in a crust, and then I made it just without the crust to see what kind of, what the liquid differ differentiation is. There is a, um, a lady, and I don't remember her name. She's, she's I've got her in my sources. Uh, slide if you want to go look at her later. Um, through the Medieval Cookery website, there is a redaction of this recipe where she doesn't have you really 
bake it in the oven, she has you make all the apples and bits um, on the stove top and then you pour it into the crust and bake it in the oven. Um, I applaud her for coming up with that, but I highly disagree with that is with 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 how this um, uh, recipe reads. So that's just my opinion. All right. So here are um, pictures of my first attempt. So um, as I said, oh, I've got two of these backwards, but as I said, so I, I cut up the apples and then um, I wanted, I just, I like making small portions because, you know, I like to eat them and I don't like to have a whole lot left over. So um, I put them, and this is just regular pie crust. I didn't re really want to make pie crust because uh, my first focus was the filling. So um, I baked some in the pie crust and then I baked some in this little little crock pot here. And I covered that with foils to make it because what you're doing, oh, go back. What you're doing is you're capturing the steam to, uh, to soften up the, uh, the, the apples. Mm. Um, so, so then this is what it looked like. The second picture is what it looked like when it came out of the oven. So that's what my crock pot looked like. And then this last picture is what my pie looked like. So you can see the crock, the, the crock pot or the dish um, has more moisture in it than what the pie crust had. Um, and then if I go to my next slide, so um, the far, uh, this darker mass, that is what, that is after I did push it through a sieve and it looks, you know, kind of like um, really thick applesauce. So I pushed it through all the, just the apples through the sieve. And then this far, uh, this far right picture with the lighter, that is after mixing the cream and the spices in. And then this middle picture here is what everything looked like when it was done. So that's uh, what the crock looked like. It probably could have gone a little longer. And then of the pies, the, the pie in the, the top pie, the pie in the middle, that one had cream in it. And then this bottom pie did not have cream in it. So I've got three kind of different variations on how this pie may have looked. Um, one issue that I did have that I did not like was when I cut the crust off, um, some of the bits of crust got in with the apple. So um, I don't, it didn't really affect much of the te texture other than I had bits of crust in there, but it was not something that I, I enjoyed. <laughs> All right, so let's go to a breakdown of the ingredients. All right, so first I'm gonna bring up the subject of tart dough. And I hope you're all giggling because I do have a rabbit on here. Um, because to me, tart and pie dough in the medieval era is a big old rabbit hole that you could go down. These recipes are normally not written down. There's something that it's, it's kind of like uh, learning the mother sauces when you start out in, in, in it with a culinary education. This is a uh, pie, pie and tart dough recipes would have been a very base recipe that you, that, that if you were a cook, you would have known it. Um, I think there are regional variations because um, I actually, I, I have seen some written down and actually I'm starting to go through some of the other recipes in this, um, uh, this uh, collection of recipes. Um, and I've got a link to the website to this collection. Um, and there are two, there's recipe 94 and 95 um, actually have to do, one of them is called to make a good pie. Um, and, and they are crust recipes. Of course, they don't give the amounts. However, um, the, the different, I haven't played around with them yet because I just, it's something that, it's a rabbit hole that right now I don't want to touch with a 10 foot, foot pole, but, um, but but the ones that it looks like they're using in this region actually have eggs in them, which is very um, uh, interesting to me because uh, usually, uh, you know, your basic pie recipe is going to be flour, fat, salt, and water. Um, there is also a um, recipe in um, an early northern uh, in early northern cookbook um, in which you are using uh, marrow. 
And in that case, they want you to, um, they use, would use the marrow from venison bones as your fat. Um, so, and that's one that I have made before. Um, I actually want to go back and remake it at some point um, whenever I can get a hold of some venison bones. About every, every hunting season, I, I find a couple hunters and poke them and be like, I want your bones, I want your bones, but I uh, haven't yet got them yet. Um, so I do have a note on here. Um, and this was, again, coming from looking through these recipes. Um, and in this, this case, in, in this collection of recipes, um, if the recipe refers to a pie, um, it has a lid. And if it refers to a tart, um, it does not have a lid. And I found that in uh, several, several cases through looking at these earlier recipes, usually if it's a tart, it doesn't have a lid. And if it's pie, it does. So that is one interesting variation um, that I have found that I'm, you know, it's good to have some, it's good to have I, some. I can corroborate and have found the same thing. Yay! <laughs> awesome. That's fantastic. Thanks, Odette. <laughs> it's good to be like, I think this is right. And then somebody else is like, yes, thank you. Awesome. All right, so we're going to move on from... Or we're both perfect. wrong exactly the same. Ah. Ah, okay. But it is more likely that we are right together than wrong together. Woo! Yay! I'm going with we're right, because why not? <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Okay, so this was an interesting chart that I found. So I was, I'm trying to find reference to... Um, uh, apples in period and um, I'm kind of thinking that um, that a lot of, a lot of our modern apples are actually um, what I would say hybrids of other apples that have been combined so I don't think I can get I think I I don't think I can get like the exact oh this, is, this would have been a period a, a apple from the 16th century but that's okay you can get trees from tree from trees of antiquity that have some period apples and pears, but I have not been successful with them surviving. I have oh. one pear and one apple, but they need to be cross-pollinated. And so the oh. other apple and the other pear, which flowered at the same time, didn't make it from where I paste planted it. So oh, I have no. so I have one pear and one apple, um, period, period uh, rootstock. That's but fantastic. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to go check them out and see. Uh, and I, I don't have any. Oh, nice. I don't have any place to plant them, but I know people. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thank you. Um, but uh, what I did find was this is, um, as you can see by the title of this, this chart, it's a total apple production in the Netherlands from 2015 to 2019. So we can see what kind of apples um, have, have been growing. Um, so, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the top three are going to be the L star, the John gold, which you can, which usually comes out here in the fall and the Kanzi. And I have not had, I've had, I've had a John gold, but I haven't had an L star or a Kanzi. Um, so you can all golden delicious is also something that we see regularly in our grocery stores. Um, so this one. Um, so today, um, I wanted to, I, um, there were no, um, I wanted to use a Golden Delicious, but it was not on the shelf. Um, I did find an Opal, which is um, a cross between, um, oh, goodness, I totally, okay. Sorry, I stopped looking at my notes. So uh, uh, Opal is a cross between a Golden Delicious and a Topaz. Um, it was developed in 1999 by the Institute of Experimental Botany in Prague. Um, so, and, and the big thing about this one is it's not supposed to brown easily. Um, so, um, going back, I totally forgot that I had, I have notes about these. So, an L-Star apple um, is a golden delicious variety developed in the 1950s. So, that's the number one apple grown in the Netherlands. The number two apple, which is the John Gold, um, is a cross between a Jonathan and a Golden Delicious. It was developed in America in the 1940s. Um, and I put down here that it's good for salads, sauce, snacking, and baking. Mm, baking. Um, and then the, the, the Kansi apple 
um, was developed in 2006. It's currently grown in the Netherlands, um, but and it's a close relation to the jazz apple, which is out of New Zealand. And that's one apple that I have seen on the grocery store shelves. Um, so going back to today's apple, I said I, I've used an opal and a red delicious, um, which is, I, I think, one of the most popular apples. It's first recognized in Madison City, Iowa in 1880. It's one of the 15 most popular apple cult cultivators in the United States. Um, it, and from 1968 to 2018, it was the most, produ most produced cultivator in the USA. So yes, you, you see the Red Delicious a lot. Um, I actually have, don't like the taste. They're a little mealy for my taste. Um, so, and I, my original plan was to use Granny Smith, but I realized today when I started cutting up apples that two apples were enough <laughs> instead of three. But um, for some information on the Granny Smith, um, it originated in Australia in 1868. It is named after Maria Ann Smith, who propagated the cultivator from a chance seedling. The tree is thought to be a hybrid of the, oh, now I have words, Malus Savitris and the European wild apple with the domesticated apple Malus Pamilla. So if you're interested in botany, there's some fun botany terms. Um, but like I said, today I just ended up using the opal and the red delicious um, to find, find make, make some pie, some more pie or something with my Granny Smith apple that I have today. Um, all right, so I'm gonna check my oven real quick. Oh, those are doing good. Those are doing good. All right, so taking a look at the spices we are, that are in this. So we've got grains of paradise, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, mace, and pot sugar. And uh, sugar, I'm all gonna talk about together on the same slide, but I wanted to list pot sugar because um, at, um, at this time we are moving, well, okay, I'll, talk, I'll wait to, I'll wait to talk about sugar till we get there. Okay, so um, grains of paradise is a uh, native native to West Africa, and it's related to ginger. As you can see, they're little little pods. Um, they, uh, um, a lot of the the recipes when I was reading about the grains of paradise, um, you you can use in place or um, with pepper is kind of what what people advise you do. Um, there isn't any pepper in this recipe, but that's sort of a modern thing. Um, so that's, and I haven't used grains. This is the first time I've got grains of paradise. They smell delicious and I can't wait to use them in some other things. Um, so next we're going to talk about ginger, which is open. Oh, sorry, these in the corner are going to be your grains of paradise. And then ginger is right up here and I've got it in a couple different forms. So it comes in a root and then I've got, it looks like I've got it in the picture. There's also crystallized ginger and then ground ginger, which you're going to, you know, that's, you're going to mostly see it um, as root and um, ground on the grocery store shelves. You can find it crystallized, but usually you have to go to the candy section or um, a bulk section. Um, so ginger is native to China, Japan, and India. And this all has to, so in the 16th century, we've really got those established trade routes coming in from, uh, from on, on ships from Asia. And I, I started looking at uh, some trade route information <laughs> and it was a lot of maps of, this is where all the boats were going. Um, now that that is its own own rabbit hole there, uh, so I'm not going to go into the trade routes, but just to know we are getting trade, lots of trade at this time, and these would have been, you know, still at this time we're still looking at at pretty pricey goods. Um, you're going to have these in your your higher end households, not really your your everyday households. I think um, the middling class. I think we're we're getting. Um, some spices in at this time, but but not but but they were still 
still not to the, uh, the extent that the higher classes were able to access them because they were expensive. All right, so moving on to cinnamon. Cinnamon comes from the barks of trees um, in the cinnamomum, cinnamomum, that's hard to say, cinnamomum family. Um, true cinnamon or kaolin cinnamon is native to Sri Lanka. And that's what I have a picture of right here. This is a picture of the true cinnamon. I've actually got some here at home and it's interesting. It has, it reminds me more of a red hot than a cinnamon taste. So if you've ever had or smelled the red hot candy, that's that's more what the, what the, the true cinnamon smells like. Um, there's mine. Um, other the varieties come from Indonesia, China, Vietnam, and Burma. Um, so next, uh, we're gonna talk about nutmeg and mace, and that's this this little guy here in the center with the red. Um, so they come from an evergreen tea, or excuse me, evergreen tree from the species um, Meristica. Um, nutmeg is a seed of the plant, whereas mace is the seed covering that is removed and then dried. Um, this is native to the Spice Islands in Indonesia. So if we look at our picture here, so this little black area here, that, that, is, that is the seed. That is where the nutmeg is actually in, that's, that's actually a shell that the nutmeg is inside. And then it's got, it's got many layers. So they're right inside is the nutmeg and then you have this black shell and then outside the shell you have this red kind of spider webby cover covering which is the mace which um it's really look up some pictures of this on google it's really interesting to see you can see pictures of it removed and it's just it's really interesting so they remove it and it dries and it does get darker as it dries so it's not you're not going to see it this red on the shelf um, so it's dried and then powdered, and then it comes in even one more casing, this, this kind of fruit nut shell. So those, that you can see why nutmeg, it's probably one of the more expensive um, um, spices that we're dealing with, um, just because it's so labor intensive to get, to get out of, the, of, its, of its casings. Um, and then moving on, last this last spice we have is going to be clove. Clove or flower buds. Whoop. Ooh. Clove or flower buds from the Cizigium arom aromatic aromaticum. Um, it's 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 uh, the buds of an evergreen, a uh, specific evergreen tree. And those um, as you, as are, are dried and they're normally ground to a powder to eat. And, or as, as if you've ever made ham or, you know, made some nice um, citrus, citrusy um, oranges uh, for, for even for, for cooking or for decoration, you can stick the whole buds into the oranges. So I'm going to go, let's see, I am going to go back. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, apology. Oh, I, 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 oh, oh, wait, no, I just go to stop screen share. Pause, pause share. There we go. So this should be, let me go back. Okay, I'm just going to stop share. There we go. I'm going to, all right. So my timer went off, so I'm gonna go to the oven and we're gonna take a pause in the lecture and I'm gonna show you what's going on with the time. So this right here is what we're looking at. And I did do, so these two here that are, you can tell they're, they've got steam in them. Um, I just left them. And then these two, I actually put some, some steam 
cuts in, so they're a little flatter. I kind of wanted to see what the moisture content was going to do with some steam vents on this. So I'm going to set those down, grab, see if I can put you down here. There we go. Now you can see what I'm doing, and I'm going to try not to burn myself. Grab this, grab my knife, and the plate. So we are just going to remove these tops and see what's happening inside. Ooh, oh, that's nice and bubbly in there. Okay. Oop. Okay, so I don't think you can see this on the screen, but I actually do have, I have my apple bits and I have kind of a liquid in the bottom. Oh, I forgot to mention. So today I'm actually using a hot water crust instead of like a regular pie crust. Um, I wanted to see what the difference was gonna be. Last time on the pictures I showed you earlier, I just used a regular Pillsbury store-bought modern pie crust. Like I said, I was dealing with the filling that time. This time I wanted to make a hot water crust and see what the difference was gonna be. And this is really, these are a lot moister. Moist, yeah, these have more moisture in them. Um, they're, they're really, I really like how the apples look in here a lot better than when I was using the regular pie crust. And this is the result I was hoping for. Yeah, that should be a lot less flaky. Yes. Because I suspect that these, these, that this crust exists strictly as a baking uh, vessel and not mm -hmm. to, to be eaten. Yes. Yes. Oh, those hey, look good. Hey, yes, ma'am. Are you seeing a difference uh, in, because I can kind of, I think I see a difference, but I wanted to ask you, are you mm -hmm. seeing a difference between the ones that had the steam vents and the ones that were allowed to steam uh, within the hot crust pastry? Like, is there yes, difference? I am. And I, I, I actually want to show you the biggest difference, it seems. And I don't, I, I, I'm guessing this is because it was pushing the crust up and away. But if you look, so this, this crust did not have a steam vent. And these had a steam vent. And yeah, so the ones without the steam vent do have more liquid in the bottom. Um, the ones with steam do have some, but not as much. And as you can see, it's, uh, um, um, because the steam was just kind of going up and up and up and not cycling back in, it has, it has, you can see the differences. Can you see the differences in the crust there just visually? This one actually is more um, gummy. Does that make sense? This, the one with the steam was more gummy because the cr crust collapsed down upon those apples. And um, you may have, I've actually still got some apple here stuck to the top, um, but the one without the steam vent actually came up a lot better and is a lot, see how thin that is compared to that one? Does this make sense? Are, Yes, it sure does. That's really cool experimentation. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, so it says to take a wooden spoon, but I don't have a wooden spoon this small. And I was thinking of running these through the sieve like I did last time, but I think I'm just, I think they're liquid enough that I can just kind of mash them around. And I'm just going to stir these up a bit and make it, it really turned out apple saucy last time which I think is okay, but I kind of want them to be a little more chunky this time. So I'm just gonna stir these up and you see that they're nicely, nicely breaking apart here. Um, get that off the side. So I'm just gonna smash those up a little bit before I add the rest of the ingredients. Get up there, there you go. Okay, this is a lot of fun. I like these, okay. 
Okay. There it is. But yes, and, and actually definitely when when mixing them up, the ones that did not have the steam vents in them are wanting to break apart a lot better um, because of the they have more liquid inside the little little capsules. So so if you can see, so these two um, did not have have the steam vents and these two did have the steam vents. So that's the big difference in those. And this one and this one do have more of a liquid inside them compared to this. Oh, that, that crust is also pretty yummy. All right, so I'm gonna mix in. It's got apple everywhere. So these are my spices. Um, I'm just using, oh, I was going to show you, not about spices. So this is a little better view of what the true cinnamon looks like. So if you've gotten the cinnamon in the store, it's usually thicker. This one's a lot thinner and it has a lot more layers in it. And like I said, it has a nice kind of almost a red hot smell to it, a sharper smell. Um, and uh, I... When, when I use that, I usually put it in my um, mortar and pestle, and it doesn't really get, I haven't um, worked it enough, I guess, to get powdery, but it almost gets like small stickies, but it's, the, the, the texture is different. But I wanted to show you, so here we go. So this is, this is my ground nutmeg, and this is, this is just regular cinnamon. This is clove, and this is fresh brown clove. So you can see it's a little chunky. I'm not very good at using the mortar and pestle yet, but we're getting there. I think I get impatient. Um, this is my grains of paradise. So if you remember the picture, they start out as um, uh, kind of uh, brown peppercorn looking. And then when you, um, when you mash them with the, 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 the pestle, uh, it, it opens up the white insides. And then this, this right here is mace. So you see it's an, it, it has a ruddy color to it, but it is not that bright red like we saw in the picture of it um, in inside the fruit. So those are my spices and I'm just going to grab another spoon, get those all mixed up here. I'm just going to disperse them throughout. Yes, Erin, I am not measuring any of this. I'm just going for it. <laughs> you know that is what I'm about. <laughs> I know, and you know that I tend to cringe when I do that. So I'm probably putting more spices in there than I should have. Remember, we're still, we're still using, this is more kind of a modern spice amount than you would in period, it would still be a very controlled, very small amount of spice because remember, they are expensive. Unless, you know, you're at Hampton Court Palace, then. Even though you didn't um, measure, all the little piles look to be approximately the same size. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this, is, this is what I do. You've kind of been eyeballing that for a long time. You should be able to tell by looking at the pile if that's a teaspoon or not. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so now I have my little my cream. So and this is just I'm just going to put a dollop in each one. And my cream's a little thick, so I was actually trying to save myself some money. I I I froze my cream, and then this morning I was like, crap! I forgot to pull my cream out of the freezer. So it's still a little still a little cold. But that's okay. So I'm just gonna mix this cream up here, and looks like I missed. Ooh, I'm 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 excited to eat this. I wish I could share this with all of you, but you know now that you'll you're learning how to make it, you can make it yourself, and and then and then enjoy it, <laughs> and make your own. You know, do your own experimentation to see how it is. Just gonna mix that up. Oh, and you know what I didn't put in. I didn't put in my sugar because we haven't really talked about the sugar yet and I didn't even get my sugar ready. That's okay. I'm actually, 
today I'm just going to put in granulated sugar because I don't, I want to taste more the spices and I don't want it to be too sweet because I want to really taste what this spice blend is going to taste like. So I'm just, today, I'm just gonna put in a little granulated sugar to sweeten it up. And then we're, we haven't got to the slide yet. I think that one's next. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about sugar. And sugar was a seasoning too. Yes, yes. Another spoon. Yes, it was still kind of this, during this time period, it seems like we find, you can tell that it's gotten a little more affordable because we do find we have more desserts that are desserts, banquet courses that are starting to have more sugar in them. And then if you've done it, anybody's done research on the Elizabethan sugar, that's really when sugar takes off and, you know, the black teeth become you know, having black teeth become, become a fashion statement because I've eaten so much sugar, I've rotted my teeth out. So this is, you know, so we're gearing up to have lots of sugar, but we aren't quite there yet. Um, I think that was, Odette, was that, I think that was you who pointed out that, yes, it is still being used as a spice at this point. Yep. Um, yep. Thank you. Thank you. So, yep. So we're getting there. So I'm just gonna level these off and I'm gonna stick these back in the oven after eating that little bit that kind of fell off. There we go. Mm. Okay, I'm really happy with how this crust turned it out. All right, yeah, we're pretty cool. All right, we're gonna go back in the oven. And I'm gonna set my timer again just so I don't forget that it's in there. Although I trust you people to go, hey, hey, you've got something in the oven. <laughs> you forgot that part. All right. Let me put this back here. Move this back out of the way. Okay, this back here. All right. Chair. All right, are we all doing good? Does anyone need to get up and stretch? This is a really good time to stretch and stand up. All right, here we go. Oh, I'm gonna check my chat real quick. It looks like, see if there's any questions. Okay, so Lynn asked about venison bones. Uh, deer every gun season, most extra shots of deer are thrown. Oh, awesome, Lynn. I will poke you about any kind of bone that has a good amount of marrow in it would be good. Femur like would be best. best. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yes, femur. What she said. <laughs> She's down there on my screen. Hi, Odette. <laughs> um, oh, and then thank you, Odette, for posting um, the Trees and of Antiquity website. Um, I also Facebook message you the actual two trees that I have. Oh, and my husband is going to go tell me which one is still alive. I think it's the Rambo. But. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yes. See, this is why I like open discussions and, and geeking out about things. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go back to screen share. And I think we were, we were just done with spices. So we're going to share. Click share and it will come up. There we go. So we are going to go to sugar. If my PowerPoint is responding. There it is. So we are going to go to sugar. So as I pointed out when I was reading the recipe, there are three mentions of sugar, types of sugar in this recipe. So I have pot sugar, sugar cake, and uh, sugar one uses for making cakes. So and I am at this point going to exit the PowerPoint if it will respond. Oh, no, 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 I don't want it to do that. Oh, I know, I pushed the wrong button, there we go. And I want to take you to this website. I did not want to write this out. Um, so this is, uh, let's see, 
This is an article that I found from 1985, and this is just to give you a very quick summary of uh, sugar history. Um, sugar and salt are those two spices, and I'm sure every spice, but to me, sugar and salt have like the most biggest histories to deal with them. So again, more rabbit holes to, to, to go down, but here is um, just, a, just a quick, quick look at a timeline. So you can see in 1100, sugar was first introduced to Europe and grouped with spices. Now we are in the Netherlands, not Europe, but we're on kind of, you know, you know, technically trade routes are being introduced and they're starting to get there. So in the 13th century, um, there was a sugar for refining Europe in, in Antwerp and then in Bristol. So we're actually refining sure, sugar in London in the 13th century, and you can see control. Yep. Uh, so yes, so they were used for medicine, med medicinal to tonics. Um, they were sold by the loaf and the pound, um, but only only the wealthiest in the 13th century. Um, and then uh, by the late 14th century, we find we find it in cookbooks. Um, by 1493. Um, yep, it's coming over to America. And in the 16th century, looks like we're getting sugar more from Brazil. Um, so it was grown in the San Domingo and shipped back to Europe by Spaniards. Spain pioneered plantations and slavery in America. Dun, 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 dun. Bad slavery. Anyway. Um, so there's just a quick look at where sh our sugar is coming from. Um, and then I go back to my PowerPoint and we want to go to this slide. I want it to open in this slide. So if I do that, it will, yes, it will open in that slide. So, um, so I, um, there's a book that I read about that it has a reference to this. Um, because the libraries are closed right now, I have not been able to look at the book. Um, uh, but I'm hoping that if I can look at that book, it has a, it's, it's one of those things, it's not a, it's a, it's a book from sources. So I want to see if that book has sources and then I can start looking into orig original sources for this information. But this book apparently talks about, and Odette, I'm sure you've read more about this than I have. Um, this book talks about um, that there are different refinements of sugar. Um, and you can actually find these on our shelves today. Yes. Um, uh, awesome. Thank you. Um, some of them, except for some of the things like because of the way we refine sugar now, things that would have just been like brown sugar where they left some of the molasses, what they now is they completely refine it to white and then add molasses back in, which is oh, cool. You now, for when you get your 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 brown sugar, your light and your dark brown sugar on the shelf, it is. Mm -hmm been refined to white and then they put molasses back in instead of stopping the cooking process and taking that mm -hmm. out. Demo oh, cool. and some of the other um, ones like jaggery and all that stuff from uh, around the world are still using more of the, um, if I'm recalling it correctly, uh, more of the traditional refining. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Thank you, Odette, for that educational moment. Dun, dun, dun. I, need, I need to have like an Odette theme song that plays now. Ta -da. She's gonna give us some great information. Yes. I hope I, thank, I, hope I do. Thank I you for being here today, Odette. I, I love it. Ironically, uh, I was gonna do a class like this, like called like, you know, the difference in, you know, what the choices you make in how you follow the recipe or mm -hmm. re, uh, re, recreate that recipe makes all the difference. I mean, I've seen that, you know, that tart of apples that floats around and you see, I've had, I've gone places where they've, whacked them up like it's just a regular apple pie and other ones where they've like actually grated it like it says in the recipe and then I've put it through a food processor um, which is a whole different thing um, and it makes a huge difference on how that pie comes out how you how you handle the apples it really does it really and it's it's so interesting that it does that mm. goodness um, so I've put in here kind of my modern um, reference to the sugar that they're referencing in the recipe. So for pot sugar, um, I'm, you know, our, I think our modern reference is going to be raw sugar, um, sugar cake. Um, you can still buy loaf sugar. You have to um, find it usually at um, 
the Hispanic um, uh, Mercados. Um, and then sugar one uses for making cakes, oh, um, is uh, a, I, it would not, it, our, technically our modern equivalent would be powdered sugar, but it was not, oh, if I go to my next slide, it was not as refined. So these are something, so as some of you know, I, I work at a, a, a grocery store. Uh, uh, so I was looking on our shelves because um, I don't, uh, I work at a more hoity-toity grocery store. Um, so these are some of the things that I could find on the shelf. So this, um, this Demerara, Demerara sugar is a, um, is a, it's kind of like turbinado sugar. It's a raw sugar. Yes. And then over here we have the castor sugar, which is a super fine. And I think this super fine is going to be more close to what the cake sugar they're talking about. You can't really see it in here, but it looks like super duper duper fine granulated sugar. Yes. You know how powdered sugar looks like snow? It doesn't have that snow look to it. It just looks like really fine. You have to be careful when you use castor sugar or super fine. Domino makes a super fine sugar, which mm -hmm. is exactly the same. In England, they talk oh. about castor sugar. We call it super fine over here, unless you're trying to be hoity-toity. Um, but it is it is pulverized. And if you are using, as we, because we, me we, we do volume measurements in our baking, and they, mm -hmm. do, they do weight measurements in England, um, you cannot... You cannot do a one-to-one -one substitution because a castor su sugar weighs more per teaspoon than granulated sugar does because there's no space between the the, the oh. between the granules. That you makes all that space in granules. So you really, if you are going to use castor sugar, do the weight cook by weight, not mm -hmm. by volume. I made that mistake when trying to make uh, meringue cookies, and let me tell you, holy crap! That, <laughs> that was a mistake like no other. Um, oh man! Briefly touching on the sugar thing because it annoys me, and I have to mention it. Uh, uh -huh. That timetable is off by a couple hundred years. Oh, okay. Because what she's leaving out is, and I'll just condense so it doesn't go too long. When the Arab world moved in with Andalusian region of Spain and all of that, they brought sugar with them because Persia had a massive sugar um, production um, well before. So that's okay. a very Egypt. Eurocentric and not accurate because sugar made its way into Europe. Um, okay, years. in the Muslim parts of Europe. Now, it was still ridiculously expensive. And um, even going back to Greeks and Romans who were aware of sugar, it was still medicinal and still working into- Honey was a hundred times cheaper. Ah. Uh. <laughs> or maybe not a hundred, but you know, if you needed to do something sweetened, it was much easier to get yourself honey, not to interrupt you, Patrick, sorry. Um, but you know, we, it is very, 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 Eurocentric because Muslim world had sugar, um, sugar cane. But of course, as we know, sugar cane is production and uh, processing is very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. So until we brought, until they brought in the slave trade, it was not economical, um, mm -hmm. which is not saying that's a good thing, but that's when the price changes happened. Mm -hmm. when they stopped paying for labor. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you both of you for such great information. That's fantastic. Yay! Yay! Sorry, I was, I'm so excited that we're discussing things. This is fantastic. Um, so the other sugar that I saw on the shelf is this um, just, just, just Polina, um, and it is an uh, unprocessed says cane sugar. So again, just another type of raw sugar. Uh, but but cool. Well, we have thank thank you for uh, both of your inputs on sugar. That's fantastic. Um, like I said, sugar is another one of those rabbit holes, like salt and like pie dough. So awesome. All right. So I'm going to get my notes out to make sure. One other sugar story is my uh, parents. Uh, my mother's uh, family was from Louisiana, and so in the 1920s and 30s. They grew their own uh, sugar cane, 
and uh, produce their own uh, um, sugar and also molasses using kid power. Oh, wow. So again, it was, uh, you know, the family used it uh, um, and uh, uh, they pr uh, produced it. So if people are in that area, it, you know, families can supply their own. But if they're not, and they had this, these massive uh, containers for uh, the um, uh, cane and that they'd have to um, keep watch over so that it didn't burn. But that was back oh, wow. in the 1920s and 30s. Wow, that is so cool though. Wow. Kid power! I like kid power. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anna, for that. Or is it Anne or Anna? Bronwyn. 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 Okay. It, say, it says Anna on my little who's talking. Yes, yes. Thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you so much for that wonderful, that's fantastic. You know, Bronwyn, you can change it to your SCA name when you're on these. You can flip it back and forth so people do. That's why when I'm on like work ones, I'm Paula. And when I'm on this one, I, f I keep it on Odette. No, I haven't figured out how to do that. I'll check with you later. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and Abby, just letting you know, you've got about a half an hour left in the Zoom session. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, we're, we're getting there. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll speed up. I just wanted to leave you with sugar with a quote that I found. This is actually from a Puerto Rican encyclopedia. And it says, Flu few plants in history of humanity have caused such an impact as sugar, tip, um, as sugar cane. This plant originally from Southeast Asia, South China, and Eastern India was planted around the world thanks to Muslim expansion. And it, it, was, uh, it was the people of the I Iberian Peninsula, however, who brought it later to the Canary Islands and the islands of Madeira, Azos, and Setoma. They later brought it to the Americas in the second half of the century, 16th century. Conquistadors, merchants, priests, and sailors, among others, were responsible for crossing the Atlantic with the plants. So I just wanted to end on that really um, interesting quote that I found um, from, like, it was a Puerto Rican encyclopedia. And yay. Okay. So moving on to cream, because cows are the best. Um, so, uh, uh, due to bad soil for farming, the Netherlands turned to the livestock industry um, in, in, in actually in the, the medieval-ish period. Um, I forgot to look back and get the date for that. Um, so, um, so there are actually three types of, of dairy cattle that are around today that, that have come out of the Netherlands. Um, so the most recognizable is going to be the Holstein. Um, the Holstein Frisian is its actual name. So it's going to be the center cow here. And I'm sure that um, you all recognize that from um, if, you, if you've been in the country around dairy farms, this is normally what you see. Um, the other American dairy cow we have is the Jersey, which is a, a, a buff colored cow. Um, but mostly you're gonna see the Holstein. And in storybooks and everything, you know, it's always depicted as a Holstein. Um, so this bovine breed recognized uh, for their use across as dairy cattle across the U.S. and the world. Um, next is going to be the bar cop. So it is not as popular in America, but it is still used over in the Netherlands. Um, okay, and lastly, the Dutch belted. Um, so the Dutch belted is um, another breed that originated in the Netherlands, um, and it is actually a, a very rare breed, and they're only used for dairy production. They're not used for beef at all. And I swear I have seen these cattle somewhere. In You've Tennessee. seen the Galway belted. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. They look very similar, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're, they're, I believe they're Galway belted. Oh, awesome. Good or to know. Good to they're, know. They're so either I'm... Irish or Scottish. They're, they're, mm -hmm. there's Bel might be Galloway. I forget, but Ooh. it's, it starts with a G. And it's 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 Scottish or Irish, and they're kind of mini cows. They're not super mini, but they're like mm -hmm. not full size. Okay, interesting, awesome. I'm gonna have to look up that. Um, I uh, um, I grew up around uh, Black Angus. That's what my parents raised. So um, although I'm not that as interested in the cattle industry as my parents, um, uh, cattle breeds do are uh, one of my um, things that I kind of I like to look at them. They're fun. 
Um, so, and I'm going to assume, and if I'm wrong, somebody let me know, does everybody know where cream comes from? Okay, I'm going to assume. Fairies? They, they come from fairies, right? Fairies. They come from fairies. Yep. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so cream is the thicker part when you milk a cow. Cream is that part that rises to the top. It is then skimmed off and processed, usually separately. Um, but you can find some, if you get some local dairy, you can find uh, the bottles with the cream in the top still. Um, and then this is my next one. Okay, we're, we're getting to the end here, which is good. Um, so lastly, we're going to talk about method. Um, and um, so let's look, let's look at the kitchens that we're using. And these are two, um, they're, they're English kitchens, but um, they're going to have very similar um, uh, tools and, uh, and um, looks to what the Netherland kitchen is going to have. So we're going to have a hearth or a hearthstone. Okay, so this top kitchen is from Mary, it's, it's Mary Arden's kitchen uh, located at Mary Arden's farm, farm in Stratford upon Avon. Uh, Mary Arden was Shakespeare's mother. Um, so, and um, this- the, the picture is not showing up. It's just in a little tiny version. Oh no, okay. Let, let me see. Let me exit out of the, and then I will see if I do this. Can you see the full slide? It should have two kitchen No, it's pictures. still the participant size. Interesting. Okay. Um, Maybe, uh, and that, that might be, um, you may have selected gallery view and your viewing options. I am currently seeing the large PowerPoint. Yeah, so am I. Oh. I'm, I changed it. Easy to do. It's all right. Were you able to get it back, Bronwyn? Yeah. All right. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so, um, so uh, this kitchen up here was built in 1514. Um, and then the bottom kitchen is from um, uh, Wilkhurst Farm. Um, it's known as the Wilkhurst Tudor Kitchen. Um, it's in Singleton, Chinchester. Um, the building, the original building was built somewhere between 1492 and 1537. Um, uh, it was originally attached to um, other buildings on, on uh, two of its so other sides. So um, right now it stands as its own building. And um, this building was actually um, originally in Kent. And um, in the 60s, they, 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 they took the building and they, they moved it to Singleton and reconstructed it as it was. Um, uh, and I want to go there someday. Uh, so as you see, both of these, and you can't see in Mary Arden's, you can't see the hearth because of the table, but both of them have a type of hearths or uh, the bottom kitchen more has a hearth stone. It has an, that open hearth and um, Mary Arden's kitchen has more of a, what well, we, we would think of maybe a fireplace type hearth, but you know, both are gonna have work tables. And then in the, the bottom kitchen, the Wilkers kitchen, you can see behind her, that is that is the oven. And that is the type of oven that this, um, this pie would have been baked in. And um, right beside the oven, um, this is a, a faggot of wood. So they had faggots and they had pimps. So the faggots were the big ones and the pits were the small ones. Um, and what they would do is they would light one end of that and then they would just, they would shove it into the oven to get it all burning and to get that oven hot. And then when that oven was nice and hot and the temperature they wanted, they would rake out all the ash and then they would put their, put their product in and, and seal the door up. And you can see the door, I can get my cursor back. You can see the door sitting right here. Um, uh, so, so that's how the ovens were working at that point. Um, and especially looking, so especially looking at this, so this is, this is a, this is a recipe for, um, more higher class folks. So they're going to, I 
I think their kitchen, you know, maybe not, if you've seen pictures of Hampton Court Palace, maybe not Hampton Court Palace, but they're going to have, uh, I think they're going to have a, a, a similar concept um, to the Wilkhurst kitchen and, 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 and the Tudor kitchen, um, or excuse me, the Mary Arden kitchen. Um, but as you see, as you can see, there are not a lot of room in those fires. So I'm thinking that putting the, covering the pie and putting it in the oven was probably the most logical thing to do to get those, to get those apples to bake. And, and if you think about like, I totally just put it in the oven and, you know, started talking to you guys. I didn't have to watch it well, or anything. I just had to make sure my pie crust wasn't going to burn. Um, remind me to check it. Um, so, so it's, it's a very non labor intensive recipe. And if you think about it, if they had put it on a pot over the fire, that would have had to have been tended and stirred to make sure those apples weren't going to stick to the pot. So that's why I think that this, this recipe is made how it is. Um, is, is just they, they use that oven to their full extent. Um, um, so, so that's kind of what I had to say about the kitchens and about baking the pie and that method. Um, so moving on. So these are some tools. So there's this really great museum, um, actually from the Netherlands. Um, I didn't write the name down. The, the, the name is in my resource slide. It's hard to pronounce. It starts with a B. But they actually have a collection of 14th and 15th century um, cookery items. And I put some of them up here just so we can get a feel of the things that we are, are working with. Um, um, so, you know, we did, I did use a knife today, so I put a knife up here. But um, aren't these, isn't this batter bowl fabulous where it has, it has the lip on it for pouring. Um, this spice chest is just, is, it's, you know, it, it exhumes, there is something precious that lives in here. Um, uh, if, if you're a fan of, of Tostin's pots, he does pots that look very similar to this. Um, I've got, I don't have one with trivets, but I've got one and I've cooked in it before. And it's just, these pots are great. They're like, they're like small um, uh, crock pots. They, they work like a small crock pot. And you can see this has the trivets because it would actually, this is something you're not putting in the oven. This is something that you're putting over the fire and then you're, you're, you're gonna put coals around it. Um, and coals under it and coals, you know, it would have a top, you would put coals on top. But then again, you can also put this near the fire and use it almost as you, you, you can, you can, you can get a spoon in there and you can cook something that you do have to stir. Dutch but again, the, <coughs> Dutch oven. Yes, thank you. <laughs> use it as a thing. There's a word. Yes, you can use it as a, yep, it's an early Dutch oven. Um, uh, but, but yeah, aren't, but it's, I just, I just love these things. Um, and then here's a dripping pan for, um, a lot of, most, all, lot of the meat, if it wasn't cooked, um, in, boiled or cooked in a soup or cooked in a pie, it was, it was roasted over, you know, actual spit roasting over the fire and this, these pans would, 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 would catch the drippings. And then I thought this fire cover was just so amazing. Um, you know, and something, you know, even a safety hazard of, okay, we're done with this. And you know, to make coals, you know, you get your fire hot and then you want to put the flame out so you have the coals. Slutty, did so, you ever um, watch the uh, Good Eats version where he made an oven with a terracotta flower pot? which reminds me very much like of this. Um, I, I've, I've seen, I haven't, I, I need, I didn't know that he had one. Um, let me write that. Um, I think he cooked a rack of, uh, mm -hmm. a rack of rib, standing rib roast in it. I've, I've seen, I actually, I tried to build a, the ovens used for 
for making non bread. I tried to build one of those once out of terracotta, it did not work out well. But I have seen pictures before of people using terracotta pots, but um, I'm sure because it's Elton Brown, he will have wonderful, wonderful, wonderful information. <laughs> so I will check that out. Thank you. Um, and I totally spelled flower wrong, flower pot. Um, so, so um, I do have a, so going, so this is, this is the end of the slides. I'm going to go over, I do have a, a page with sources on it. I know they're hard to read. Um, but uh, uh, this slideshow is available. Um, um, Aaron, where is this available at? I, is it on the website? On the uh, we on? have we have put it on your event page. So where the event page is, essentially where you got onto the Zoom, uh, mm -hmm. we have um, added your slideshow in as well. Okay, thank you. So um, you can download the slideshow from the event site, or yeah, from the event page. Um, if you want to take a look at some of these um, sources, these aren't all of my sources, but these were, um, I kind of tried to put the more interesting ones. So I've got um, links to more information on the Woolkirch Farm and Mary Arden's Farm. Um, this is the museum, um, Boyd Boydman's Museum, um, an online collection. Um, just, uh, it, it takes a little fiddling with their search engine. Um, you kind of have to go to like ceramics and 14th, 15th century. You kind of have to play with um, the filters to, to find um, the collection. It's, it, it's not easy to find, but if you go to the, the gallery and play with the filters, you can just see amazing things. Um, so this is the app, the Apple pipe, the Apple chart. Um, this was a great website that I got great information on apples from. Um, this was the sugar timeline I used, which was we we're finding not very accurate. Um, this is the hot water crust recipe I used um, on my Facebook page, and I need to make it publicly seeable. Um, I actually made a hot water crust recipe I'm doing on Sundays. I do bake along with Abby, and uh, and I made the hot water crust crust pastry on that this morning. And then there is the link to the Netherlands cookbook and then uh, the link to the medieval cookery interpretation if you want to look at that. Um, so there is my email. If after this you have any questions, just email me. But I just got my, I'm going to stop my screen share and go back to all your faces. We're going to take this out of the oven and see what it looks like. And I put everything on my cooling rack. Oh, it smells good. It smells very good. So here's what we look like right here. So I think I want to see. They are bubbly. I think I am going to bake them a little bit longer to see if they will solidify anymore. But there is some nice little nice little tarts, nice little little apple tarts. They are still fairly liquidy. Like I said, they smell good. They look a little creamy, so I'm excited to try one. But like I said, I'm going to bake them for about at least 15 more minutes. And I forgot to point out that the crusts are holding up a lot better than uh, a modern pie crust would, would hold up. At this point, I was really, when I did my first batch, I was really afraid of, of burning, of, of getting my crust a little too brown. And they were um, very, very crispy and not very good tasting um, at the end. But then again, you know, this is, we're talking about the period where crusts were still um, considered cold coffins. So it was, it was a very hard crust that uh, was reused a lot. Um, oh, I'm looking at the chat. Oh yes, thank you Odette for, for posting Salt, A World History. That is, that is, that is a good book. And, um, and oh, the belted Galloway. Thank you. Um, all right. So at this point, um, questions, questions at all. 
Um, just real. Yeah. This was really fun. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Uh, uh, my mother always used to make a cinnamon red hot applesauce, oh. and uh, that's uh, shall we say powerful because it really <laughs> is the red hot. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um. Trying to think if there's anything I missed. I don't think so. Um, but um, thank you all for joining me today. This was fantastic. Um, you know, cook, cooking online is always is always interesting. So I hope that uh, the format of this class worked for everybody. It seemed to work um, for me. Um, so I hope you all stay happy and healthy. And I will hopefully see you all soon <laughs> at an event or at another rum class. Um, Cause these are great. These are great. Thank you, Erin, for setting this up. Yeah, yeah. And for being my host. So You're very there. welcome. Thanks for showing how we can get cooking classes to work on yes. online yeah. because I've been dying to try and figure out how to, I, and of course I can never figure out what anybody wants to learn either. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I just kind of all of my classes. I'm like, eh, everybody knows what I know. <laughs> oh, well, it was I. I asked um, uh, Mistress Cat from um, over over in the flame. I said, I'm I'm looking for a period recipe that's I can teach to people in under an hour, and it's simple. <laughs> and she sent me this one, and I looked at it. I'm like, this is not simple, and I see a rabbit hole coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. So, I'm, yep. so this was this was great. I thank uh, you're welcome to everybody who is saying thank you on the chat. Um, uh, it was great. I had fun. Glad you. Had now fun. the next thing is you've got to have some pear uh, pies. Mm hmm. Or charts. Um, mm, that yes, pear pear pears are one of my favorite things to work with, and I I can actually get fresh 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 pears in the fall from some friends who have pear trees. I've only ever made one thing with pears that I've actually enjoyed. So, Ooh, mm -hmm. and it was, like, it was the weirdest thing ever. It was, it was a cheese pie. Oh, interesting. From a 16th century Dutch recipe that used brie and pears. And yeah, I'll send you. Interesting. Yeah. And it was very tasty too. Isn't, oh, you that the it. isn't that the recipe that you took to a vigil? I did. That was the those were the yeah. cheese, those were the cheese pies I made for Ava for Ava's vigil. Yeah. All righty. If there are any more questions, we will go ahead and end it here. Abby, thank you. Or well, thank, you. Me. thank you so much. I think everybody really enjoyed it. Thank yes. you everyone for joining me.